Again, good morning, everyone. Beautiful day. We might have rain coming our way. Be praying for the people on the coast with the tropical storms coming in. I think they say they're coming in tomorrow. But uh, the wonders of this world that God created. You know, we're headed toward a meltdown, aren't we? And I don't mean politically, economically. I'm just talking about that God is going to bring this all to an end sometime. But he has so design things as to teach us, to inform us that we'll be ready. And when it comes, it's a thief in the night. We're going to be ready, right? We're going to be ready for the Lord's return. Our theme this morning is, oh, how I love Jesus. And we welcome everybody out there in Facebook land and uh, those who are gathered here to join in with us as we worship our Lord and our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We're thankful for all they've done for us, and truly, with all that we've learned in our life, we have learned to love Jesus greatly. So let's get our songbooks, and let's get our hearts in tune, and let's sing. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. When you sing psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, does it help your feet to be planted on higher ground? Does me. A little down and out, or no matter what's going on, good or bad, and you have a song in your heart, it really makes a difference. And I would say for the last at least couple of weeks, this song that we're looking at today has been on my mind, and, and um, it's been in my heart, and I've been singing along, driving in the car, working at home, whatever, wherever. I don't suppose we're going to be hearing too many of those for a while, or not like we have had, I've been hearing over the years. I mean, I can think of, da, 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 oh, never mind. What about a, a great march tune? It motivates, it, it, it moves the soul. If you've been in the military, it says something. You know, patriotic songs, God bless America. Our national anthem, national anthems of other countries. I think one year at camp, Camp Watoga, North Georgia Bible Camp. Our week has already always been, I hadn't been lately, but it was always 4th of July week. What a week to have it. 
And one year, as during the day at some point, the national anthem was played, but then the national anthem of Canada was played. Oh, Canada. And one of the ladies at camp began to cry because she was from Canada. And she heard her national anthem. Someone thought of her. Oh, she's an American. Well, she's she's you know, United States citizen now, but she's of Canada, has relatives in Canada, and that song moved her. Music is mighty. It moves the soul and it, it motivates our spirits. Reading from 1 Samuel 16 and verse 23, just an example. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, Saul, king of Israel, the first king. When the harmful spirit was of, from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well. And the harmful spirit departed from him. Music. Little shepherd boy David, he didn't really know David that well. We find out later when David comes in wanting to face the, take the challenge from Goliath. But early on, Saul was one that came from his father's field, from keeping the sheep, and would play tunes for this great king. And it would soothe his soul. 2 Chronicles 20, 21 and 22, another example. And when he had taken counsel with the people, he appointed those who were uh, to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire. Does it sound like a church service, a worship service is about to begin? That's not it at all. They're about to go into battle. They're about to go into battle. An army has come against Judah. And the king appoints those who were to sing to the Lord and praise him in holy attire as they went before the army and say, Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. And there are a number of psalms, one in particular, that continues to repeat that phrase, and maybe that was the song they were singing. Give thanks to the Lord, for his steadfast love endures forever. His steadfast love is with us as we go into this battle. And when they begin to sing and to praise, the Lord set an ambush against the men of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, who had come against Judah, so that they were routed. The army of Judah had a victory that day. The anthem that went before them was a song to the Lord and of the Lord. Music is mighty. You need refreshing. Do you, when you're struggling, do you want to stand? Let me suggest with the scriptures, sing, sing. Oh, pray, yes, but sing. The song is strong. Habakkuk 3, 17 and 18. Though the fig tree should not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, the produce of the olive fell, and the fields yield no food, and the flock be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls. That's a terrible economic situation, agriculture situation for a people, for a nation. Nothing is producing. There's reason to have anxiety and fear. We don't have any of that today, do we? Any struggles? Any things to be anxious about? Everything's just going great. No, at times in our lives, even whether it's a national thing, a local thing, or just in our own family, things have happened. We struggle. And so Habakkuk says, though all of this fell, it's a sad situation in our land. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. It's like this prophet is saying, Times are bad, but oh, how I love Jesus. And I could almost see him day by day as he faces things or people are saying things, talking about, you know, around the water cooler. Or what, oh, you don't go around the water cooler or water fountains anymore. They're all shut down because of the virus. But people still converse, whether it's online or how, and are talking about our woes. And, and you say, but oh, how I love Jesus. Isn't God good? Lyrics and style of music combine to give voice to all kinds of emotions. 
that can lift our spirits. It can cause us to be saddened. It can just all kind of things can come because of the song, the style of the song. In times of spiritual battles and barrenness, God provides the power of the song. Song is strong. He provides the power of the song in the night to break through to victory and fruitfulness. The power of a song. Listen to this phrase and we'll repeat it again. Worship in the dark can open doors of light and hope. Worship in the dark can open doors of light and hope. I mean, it's almost as if we're worshiping in the dark. At times in the world, Christians have worshiped, in a sense, in the dark. But those songs and all that is said and done on an occasion like that, it does open up doors to others. And it brings hope to people around that hear. So if you're longing for a release from the prison of despair, what? Keep singing. Keep singing. Oh, how I love Jesus. Hey, we got to sing, don't we? Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because he first loved me. What a wonderful song. What a good thought. I mean, you can just sing that, that chorus, that refrain, over and over again. Even if you can't remember the rest of the song, and probably many of you do, or at least parts of it. But oh, how I love Jesus. That song fuses a 19th century English text with an American tune. It says uh, what I've read most likely from the camp meeting era. When people would get together under the brush arbors or out in the open or just large groups would come together and, and, and this song was, was taught and learned and they sang it. Fairly simple words, but so uplifting, so helpful, especially when you get into chorus. Everybody could sing together on that. Oh, how I love Jesus. Hymns that focus on the name of Jesus, they are a significant part of congregational song, of singing. Go through, the, script, uh, go through the, the text of the songs in the songbook and see all the ones that have to do with Jesus, our love for him, his care for us. All the things about Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. What a name. The power of Jesus' name is a theme that has many biblical sources. And I could begin to read multiple sources and you would wear out pretty quick no you wouldn't but I have one I want to share it's from Philippians 2 verses 10 and 11 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father what a wonderful tune of praise in a sense or a song of praise Paul has written there that at the name of Jesus, when his name is spoken, when he is thought about, it causes praise to go up to God. And we ought to confess his name, acknowledge his name often in word to other people, but in song also. I mean, if you started singing, oh, how I love Jesus, when everybody was kind of down, I would, I would think that might lift some spirits. I know there are people out there that would get angry, but it would sure get their attention. Why do you love Jesus? Oh, and you could tell them why. As we previously noted, and I said I would repeat, worship in the dark can open doors of light and hope. Worship in the dark. When there are dark times, times of despair, anxiety, agony, and you begin to maybe quote a verse of scripture or sing a song, a hymn, a spiritual song, like, oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, what it can do for you and for those that are around you. Worship in the dark can open doors of light and hope, and that is just what happened. Late one night, in a prison cell, 
In what city? Philippi. A European city. Paul and Silas and others have been spending their time in Asia. In the Middle East, we would say, and over into Asia, what is now Turkey. And Paul received the Macedonian call in Acts chapter 16. Timothy has joined up with Paul and Silas in the beginning. They've been through Derby and Lystra, places like that. And, and, and then Paul receives at Troas the Macedonian call. Come over and help us. We want to hear the name of Jesus. It's the Lord sending him into Europe. They end up at Philippi and Lydia, down by the riverside with other women. They're worshiping, they're praying. And Paul comes and begins to teach. And Lydia and her household are converted. They come to a faith in Jesus Christ. And Paul and Silas are active in Philippi. And wonders are being done through the power of God that's within Paul. People are amazed. People are amazed. And something takes place. We sing, there is a name I love to hear. I love to sing its worth. It sounds like music to my ear. It's the sweetest name on earth. What is it? Oh, how I love Jesus. And I think about Paul and Silas. I want to begin reading in, in Acts chapter 16 at verse 22. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. That's Paul and Silas. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, ordering the jailer to keep them in safety. Having received this order, he put them in the inner prison and fastened their feet in stocks. These men will not escape. When they're called to go before the magistrates tomorrow, they'll be there to go. I'll take them personally. About midnight, what is a prisoner who's unjustly in prison to do? Cause a great disturbance. You've seen the old westerns and somebody's thrown into the jail. They got their little tin cup and they start ringing it up and down the bars. Making all kind of racket. Well, Paul and Silas, you might say caused a disturbance, but it was nothing like that. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. Can you imagine? And the prisoners were listening to them. Now, I'm going to suggest here the jailer is, uh, he's, you know, his, his domicile, his dwelling place with his family, servants, is, is attached to the prison. He's there in his comfy bed asleep. But the guards, well, the prisoners, they're hearing Paul and Silas as they sing and pray. Praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened. <laughs> what did I tell you about singing? It'll open doors. And everyone's bonds were fastened. Would that not give the prisoners hope of escape? When the jailer woke and saw the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. He's responsible with his own life. If he loses a prisoner, his life can be taken, and likely would be, especially that evening if all the doors are open. Certainly all the prisoners in the darkness have gone into the streets, and they're, 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 they're not to be found. And the next morning he'll be called. And he'll be held responsible. His life will be lost. And he determines, I'll take my own life this evening. He was about to kill himself, supposing the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried with a loud voice, Do not harm yourself. We are all here. Don't harm yourself. We're here. You're okay. Don't fear. You don't need to have this anxiety. None have escaped. Well, Paul and Silas are there unjustly. But what have they been doing? Praying and singing. In the midnight hour. Praying and singing. And the prisoners were listening, and no doubt it was opening up doors of light and hope. Or helping them to overcome fears of what might be the next day or the day to come, whenever they would be judged. These two men. Maybe some of the prisoners came to an understanding that they were there unjustly. Maybe they've heard of the great things that Paul and Silas were doing and the teachings that they were, they were sharing with the people, the citizens of that city. 
And now they're in prison. They've been beaten and thrown into the inner prison, put in stocks. And about midnight, they're praying and singing. That earthquake comes. They could escape, but they do not. They do not. Music is mighty and the song is strong. And, and I could almost hear, except the words hadn't been written in this way back then. But I could almost hear Paul and singing. Paul and Silas singing, oh, how I love Jesus, and so many other songs that we would know of, but they were probably singing songs from the Psalms and other songs that would, that would lead to the idea of this Messiah that was coming has come, and, and, and they're, they're engaged in song concerning and prayer concerning God the Father and the Lord Jesus the Son, and what a difference it makes. Songs. It tells me of the Savior's love who died to set me free. Paul's in prison. Silas is in prison. The earthquake was not to set them free. It was to set some others free. It tells me of the Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. The sinner's perfect plea. We all have sinned and fallen short. We all have transgressed. We've all broken the laws of God. We've done those things we ought not to do. They need to be repented of. They need to be confessed. We need to deal with them. And all that we could do concerning what we've done wrong would not forgive. There's the admission of sin. But it takes the one sinned against to do the forgiving. And God is the one sinned against and he sent his son to die, to shed his blood, to provide the propitiation, the price for our sins, to pay the price. We deserve death for sin, and God, through his son, paid the price that we might have mercy and grace, that we might be forgiven of our sins. Acts 16, 29 the jailer called for lights and rushed in, and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. He is a Roman jailer. He has authority. Those that are under him must listen. And they're all in jail are responsible to him. And here he is at the feet of Paul and Silas, falling at their feet. He has seen something, heard something, he knows something here, something different about these men. It's Jesus. He called for lights, rushing in, trembled with fear. He fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Think for a moment. As I suggested earlier, he was probably asleep in his bed. He's comfortable. And this thing has happened with the earthquake. He's afraid the prisoners have escaped. And Paul assures him, we're all here. There's something about this man, Paul. There's something about this man, Silas. There's something about the charges against them. And there's some awareness in, in him concerning these men and salvation. What must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. And the question could come, how can I believe unless somebody tell me? There's a scripture about that somewhere. How can I know about Jesus and somebody, unless somebody tells me? He's a Roman. He's in a European city. Oh, there's some Jews living in the area. He knows about their God maybe, but this Jesus. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who was in the house. Jesus said, go teach me. Go into all the world and teach me. Bring them to a faith, a belief, an understanding about who I am and what I am for them. And they spoke the words to him. They told him about Jesus. No doubt they told him about, oh, how we love Jesus. And we want you and your family and your, and your servants to, to love Jesus too. We want you to be in unison with us and a love for God the Father and the Son, Jesus Christ. We want you to know his word, his ways, his will for you. And they spoke to him the word of the Lord. 
to all who was in his house, whatever family he had there and servants, they were part of the household. I don't know how many were gathered on that occasion, but it would have been a number. And he took them, the jailer, took Paul and Silas, the same hour of the night. Oh, this is moving quickly. And he washed their wounds. Washed their wounds? It's not the jailer's responsibility. I mean, as far as he was, would have been concerned the day before, if I take them before the magistrate tomorrow, they can go with all their wounds, their blood stained. They can go in agony before the magistrate, before the judge. But this night he washed their wounds and he was baptized, immersed at once, he and all his family. They came to a faith in Jesus Christ. They believed on the Lord. And they were immersed, the, sin of, the, the sins were forgiven, the washing of the blood of Jesus at that point, the power of the blood of Jesus was applied. And they were cleansed, they were forgiven. They came to a faith and they were saved. And he brought them into his house and set food before them. Does that not show a change in that jailer? We call it repentance, a change of heart. A man who would have seen that they just ate whatever and now he's setting his food before them. What a change in this man. And then it says, And he rejoiced along with his entire household that they had believed in God. Before, I guess, he would have believed in gods. The Roman pantheon. He might have had a god for his house. It would have been the god for the city of Philippi. And he probably would have given some allegiance to that god. But now he knows the one true God, the creator of the universe, the one who sent his son Jesus to die for the sins of mankind, to provide as he had promised in the long ago a savior. And he knows about Jesus now. And he had come to a faith to believe in the God of heaven and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, he and all his household. And that very night they were immersed, they were baptized, their sins were washed away. Now they were a part of Paul's party, his group, no, Christ's church his family the jailer in his household part of the family of God now and I could almost hear them in the days to come singing oh how I love Jesus because he first loved me you know that's the whole key because he first loved me I love Jesus because why Oh, he's benefited me greatly in life. I have things. I have food. I have clothing. I have shelter. God did that from the beginning. He's blessed mankind. He's shown himself to be good and gracious. But man sinned. All have sinned. We've all fallen short. Where is the forgiveness to come from? Where is life to come from? God provided in his son Jesus Christ for life. Now there's one thing about that. I could say it this way, we better obey him. That's what faith is about. Reliance upon. Not just a matter of I acknowledge that Jesus is, but he's my Lord, he's my Savior. I'm going to listen to what he says, I'm going to do it. It's going to be hard sometimes. Sometimes I'm not going to want to do what he says. Because I'm of this world, and people are influencing me, and they want me to do something different than what Jesus says. And Jesus says, if you love me, Oh, how I love Jesus. You'll keep my commandments. And we sing, oh, how I love Jesus. And what do we do? We keep his commandments. We learn them. We come to know them and we keep them. Therein is safety. Therein is that salvation. Oh, how I love Jesus because, because he first loved me. Because he first loved me. I hope we will daily live that love for Jesus. I hope if in any way we, we look at ourselves and say, you know, right now in this situation, I'm not living my love for Jesus. I'm not doing what I ought to, and I need to correct that. And I hope we'll make those corrections. And in whatever ways we need to respond to God the Father and to the Lord Jesus Christ, we will do the right things. And if we've been going in the wrong direction, we would turn around and come back and do it right. Because God, a long ago, could have turned his back on us and just gone on off. But he never did that. 
He continued to work his plan through history to bring the Savior, Jesus, to this earth. For God so loved the world. And there are a lot of people in the world that don't love God. And we need to so live and so pray and so sing that more light will come into other people's lives and they'll know the love of God. Let us sing about our love for Jesus.
we come to the portion of our services this morning where we partake of the Lord's Supper. It is a memorial to the death of our Savior. We're instructed to examine ourselves as we partake, and that can sometimes, for me personally, be very difficult to do. As we prepare our minds to partake, I would like to read a passage of Scripture and then pose a couple of questions for each of you to answer within yourselves. As I read, you're welcome to follow along with me, but please try to envision what the passages are saying and what's happening as I read. I'll be reading from Luke chapter 7, beginning in verse 36. And one of the Pharisees desired him, speaking of Jesus, that he would eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and sat down to meet. And behold, a woman in the city, which was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at meat in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster box of ointment and stood at his feet behind him weeping and began to wash his feet with tears and did wipe them with the hairs of her head and kissed his feet and anointed them with ointment. Now when the Pharisee which had bidden him saw it, he spake within himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would have known who and what manner of woman that this is that toucheth him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answering said unto him, Simon, I have somewhat to say unto thee. And he saith, Master, say on. Jesus said, There was a certain creditor which had two debtors. The one owed five hundred pence and the other fifty. And when they had nothing to pay, he frankly forgave them both. Tell me therefore which of them will love him the most. Simon answered and said, I suppose that he to whom he forgave most. And he said unto him, Thou hast rightly judged. And he turned to the woman and said unto Simon, Seest thou this woman? I entered into thine house. Thou gavest me no water for my feet. But she hath washed my feet with tears and wiped them with the hairs of her head. Thou gavest me no kiss. But this woman, since the time I came in, hath not ceased to kiss my feet. My head with oil thou didst not anoint, but this woman hath anointed my feet with ointment. Wherefore I say unto thee, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is forgiven, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. And they that sat at meat with him began to say within themselves, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? And he said to the woman, Thy faith hath saved thee. Go in peace. As you examine yourselves this morning, and this is true of me as well. Ask yourselves, how have you viewed those you've came in contact with this past week? Whether it be your family, your neighbors, your friends, your co-workers. Have you given in to temptation yourself this past week? Are your sins many or are they few? 
if Jesus was here with us in the flesh this morning, if He was among us, what would He say about your willingness to forgive others? What would He say about your views about those around you? What would He say about your faith? These are very difficult questions sometimes for me to answer. Looking in the mirror is sometimes very difficult to do. We've sung the song that says, Oh, how I love Jesus. That's a statement. The price of our salvation was paid with the highest price that could be paid. Jesus was very brutally beaten, made fun of, and and ultimately His body was physically nailed to a cross. And He went to that cross for us. So the statement that we say this morning is, Oh, how I love Jesus. As we partake of these emblems this morning, within yourself, is it true or not true? Oh, how Jesus loved us. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning as we prepare to take of this loaf which represents the broken body of your son Jesus. Father, we try our best to envision the pain and anguish and sometimes that's hard to envision. But Father, we thank you for sending him to the cross because he loved us enough to go through all of it. Father, as we partake of this loaf, help us to keep these things in mind. Father, please, above all that we ask, forgive us of our sins when we stumble. This prayer we humbly ask in Christ's name. Amen. Let us again bow as we partake of the cup. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning as we prepare to partake of this cup, which represents the blood that he shed as his body was broken. The blood from his body ran down, and we acknowledge that it washes us of our sins. Again, Father, we thank you for your willingness to send Jesus to us. And Father, we ask that as we partake of this cup, that you would help us to do so by whatever means that you can to help us to keep our hearts right and to partake of it in a worthy manner. Again, Father, above all that we ask, please forgive us of our sins when we stumble. This prayer we ask in Christ's name. Amen.
That concludes our partaking of the Lord's Supper this morning. We now have a convenient time that we normally take up our collection for the week. As it was put before us this morning, we do have, at least here in the United States, we have plenty of food and we have lots of blessings. And even in a country like the one that we have, there are those that are in need. I would propose that we have a spiritual famine within our land today. And this might seem discouraging, and sometimes we see things that go on in our world that, that really are discouraging. But these are opportunities, if, if we dig deep and if we focus our minds correctly, these are opportunities for us to share the gospel and the truth with other people. And when we take up these funds, that's what we try to do with them. And so as we take up our collection, let's try to remember, again, all those around us and what their spiritual needs are. And, and, and think about not just what we put in the plate this morning, but what we do and say and how we interact and how we view others in the coming week. Let's go to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we come before you this morning as we prepare to give back as we have so richly been blessed. Father, we would ask that you would help us to remember that money is just a tool that we use and that it's ultimately our responsibility to go out into the world and spread the gospel. Father, sometimes we don't do that when we should. Father, sometimes we are given to temptation and we fail. Father, please be merciful to us as we can't get through this life and into the next without your forgiveness and your mercy. Again, Father, please forgive us of our sins. This prayer we humbly ask in Christ's name. Amen. What a wonderful day it is. Such a blessing to be able to be out and some together here and others with us in spirit, watching through the means of Facebook. When you think about all that is happening in our world and the opportunities it's presenting us, things like what we've got going on over here and with this camera up here and you out there and, and us gathered the means we have of getting the message out to so many. The way we can share through the internet, Facebook, YouTube, so many means. I think about what we're doing is like baskets of bread and cups of water. There are people that are thirsting, hungering for righteousness. And it takes some time, it takes some effort, it takes some funds, and, and, and we're sharing with so many. I can think about Mike Reganus over at the Ringo uh, Congregation, Church of Christ in Ringo, Georgia. And he does a daily devotional, you know, through the week on Facebook. And many others are supplying things like that. I generally, every day, maybe post a devotional. I might miss some days. My mom gets on to me for it. Not really, but just so many ways of sharing, of giving. Besides just being able to gather here. And I'm thankful that we have that opportunity and that there are people that can share with us. And you know what we've done today will be out there. 
And at any time, somebody could, could just search for Yona Vision. They could find the Facebook. And, and we're, we're working on building the YouTube. But they can go and see the message that have been presented. They can look at, you know, you can go for Mike Organus. And, or you could go to other places and find churches, uh, churches of Christ and all, all through the land that are supplying bread and water for the spiritual hunger, those that are hungering and thirsting. Today, as we close, I want to think about a few things. Um, and we noticed that Fred House is not with us today. He has been having some physical difficulties. Mary is healing from her um, um, fall and her surgery. She's rehabbing. Hopefully, it won't be much longer that she'll be able to be up and, 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 and around better. Um, Mary Holcomb's with us this morning. Al, I understand, has improved some. I guess it kind of comes and goes with the days, but we're praying for you uh, and Al. Uh, and the physical difficulties there. Jim has been back with us for a couple of weeks or so. Of course, he, he was out of town last week, but he's been over here at the laptop and clicking buttons today, and I'm glad he's able to do that because that means his eye's healing. He's had a lot of difficulty with it, but we're glad that that is coming along, and Amelia will shower and the improvement she's made and others that are listed here in our bulletin. Continue to pray for them. Uh, today is... August the 23rd, and Helen has a birthday on the 26th, and many of you have already filled out cards, and, and Priscilla got all those together, and she's going to see that Helen gets those birthday cards, all those wishes. Um, uh, she remains in Friendship uh, Nursing Home, a rehab uh, center, health center, and we just continue to pray for her. Again, thank you all for being a part of this service this morning. It is our service to the Lord Jesus Christ and our Father in heaven, and we're thankful for all of you out there that are, are with us. And I know many of us will later today be sharing this so that many others of our friends and neighbors can pick up on it and they can, uh, they can listen to you sing and they can share in the message and they can be uplifted along with us in singing, Oh, How I Love Jesus. Now let us join our voices in song for one more song after this prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this day, for the sunshine, for the blessings of life, for all the many wonderful things that have come our way. Even as we so often through the week are listening to things, hearing things, and, and just a lot of dark thoughts might come. It's a lot of despair, a lot of anguish. But again, it's because people have turned their back on you. They have no light in their life. And men and women and young and old are all over searching Searching, 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 crying out for something better. And so much hatred and harm is coming out of it in so many cases. Because maybe that's the only way to solve problems. But not with you, Lord. We know that. You would like for us to be humble and peaceful. And so act toward others in this world that it might uplift them and might help them. And Father, help us to do that this week. Help us to be what we ought to be, to be letting our light shine, to be doing the good works as we have opportunities so that we can bring light, we can bring hope into lives. And just perhaps we'll find ourselves someplace this week singing a song, maybe it'll be, oh, how I love Jesus or something, and someone will hear, it will lift their spirits. And we're hoping, Father, for those, we're praying for doors to be open for people when they, when they see our lives, they hear what we have to sing or to say that they'll want to know more and give us an opportunity when the door of that prison is thrown open to come in and to invite us into their homes, into their lives, to share with them our knowledge of Jesus, our love for Jesus and for you, God. Be with us and bless us in this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.